When I was in my 20s, one of my buddies had left town for the weekend. He was a single guy who lived alone in a tiny house that backed up to some woods and needed somebody to watch Baxter, a little black kitten he had just adopted. For two months prior, my buddy had been working at a local farm and Baxter was a part of the litter that one of the barn cats had given birth to. He was the runt, and his mother often ignored him on top of his siblings, pushing him out of the way when it came to nurse. So, he was left neglected, malnourished, and partially starving. My buddy, who's always been an animal lover, and too sympathetic for his own good, decided to take Baxter home and nurse him back to health. This worked, however. Baxter had caught an infection which would require him to take medicine three times a day. This would otherwise be fine if my friend didn't have a family emergency that required him to skip town for a bit. On top of that, the medicine had to be dispensed a few hours before or after Baxter ate. So my buddy asked me to house it and take care of Baxter in exchange for some money. I was also single, disconnected from my family, and struggling with unemployment, so I had no financial support system in place. I definitely needed the extra cash. So I agreed, despite the short notice, of course. He gave me a piece of paper indicating when to feed Baxter and when to give him his medicine. He also told me not to let Baxter outside, that he had a tendency of trying to escape. It seemed easy enough, and as my buddy had cable, I could just keep myself entertained while staying at his house for the day. The first few hours of the house were pretty uneventful. The most exciting thing was the task of trying to get Baxter to take his meds. It was in liquid form that came in a syringe, and I had to dispense it in his mouth. If you've ever owned a pet, you'd know how much of a pain in the butt they can be when it comes to that kind of stuff. Still, I managed to make it work, and I fed him three times a day that my friend asked me to. Most of the time, I just watched TV, while Baxter slept on my lap. I'm not too much of an animal person myself, but given the Baxter I had heard about him, I figured I should let him have the attention that he was deprived of back at the farm. After giving Baxter his last dose of medicine, right around 9 p.m., I decided to call it a night. I'd be back in the morning, so it wasn't like he was going to be left alone for a super long time. I opened the door to leave when I felt Baxter's fur brush up against my legs as he sprinted out the door, and given he had dark fur, I wasn't able to see where he'd run off at first. I didn't have a flashlight or anything of the likes, so I followed him to the best of my ability into the woods. There, I had lost sight of him completely. I walked around, putting my hands around my mouth as I called for him. I didn't even know if he knew his name yet. I heard some hissing and low meows come from the distance, the noises only getting louder and louder as they went on. I jogged towards them stopping to find two pairs of glowing eyes staring at me. The first were clearly from Baxter. They appeared to be high up in a tree branch and were pretty small. The other, though, were all still high up or much bigger. It took a moment for my eyes to adjust in order to make out the figure that belonged to them, and at first, my brain couldn't make sense of what it was. I'd never seen an animal like that in my life. As funny as it sounds, even though it was anything but hilarious in that moment, its body resembled that of a wrestler, or even a bodybuilder. Its spine had a nearly C-shaped curvature to it, and its arms stretched high above its head as its gigantic claws gripped the tree that Baxter was in. Its head didn't match its human-like figure at all. It was simply that of a dog's. The monster had quickly lost interest in Baxter, and directed its attention now towards me. Going back down on all fours, and though there wasn't much light, 
I was able to make out the deep scratches it had made in the tree that it had taken hold of. I didn't even have the time to scream and found myself running for my life before I even knew it. I had gotten back to the house, locking the door behind me and pushing a nearby shelf in front of it. I then went to the back door, panicking, which was already locked and also blocked it with furniture nearby. I paced around, trying to make sense of what had just happened. I peeked out a window, but there was nothing in sight, and I wondered if the thing even bothered to chase me in the first place. Did I just dream this whole thing? Was I sleeping and this was a nightmare? I knew Baxter was probably dead by now, or at least he would be soon, and I knew my buddy was going to kill me if that was the case. Somehow, I didn't think he would believe me if I told him that there was some sort of hellish-looking creature lurking in the woods behind his house. He'd been living there for three years and never spoke anything about the sort. Although I appeared to be safe, I didn't feel comfortable even going outside to leave in my car. So I spent the night in the house. I somehow managed to fall asleep. When I awoke the next morning, I pondered on whether I should try and look for Baxter. He was probably dead, and the creature from the night before was still in there. But at the same time, I didn't know how my buddy would react to such an event like losing Baxter. I ultimately decided I'd look for him, but only got so many yards into the woods before giving up and turning back. I wasn't going to put myself in unnecessary danger for just a cat. I moved the furniture back and went to search for Baxter. I called out for him, and to my pleasant surprise, I heard him meowing. I followed the meows, and he was still up in the tree that I had found him in last night. I was more easily able to see the scratch marks in the bark now, and they were even longer and deeper than I'd ever remembered. They seemed to be more closely resembling gashes, and a shiver went down my spine just upon the sight of it. I then noticed paw prints on the ground, most of them leading back into the deeper section of woods. As quietly as I could not to attract any attention from the beast, I encouraged Baxter to come back down from the tree. It took a couple of minutes, but eventually he complied, and I carried him back to the house, pacing my walk as fast as I could. I fed him, and thought about what to do next. Ultimately, I ended up packing up his food and medicine and brought him back to my apartment. My landlord did not allow animals, so I had to be careful when it came to getting him in. I gave him some newspaper to use as a litter box, but the damn thing pissed on the floor anyway. I just kept him in the bathroom for most of the time after that and fed him and gave him his medicine at the time that it said the previous day. Once it was time for my buddy to come back home, I took Baxter back to the house and instead of leaving, decided to wait for my friend. Once he entered the house, he seemed surprised to see I'd stuck around but wasn't unwelcoming him or anything. I gave him a few minutes to wind down and settle in before letting him know the events that unfolded just a couple of days prior. He was mostly just confused and asked if I was sure that it wasn't just a wild dog. I told him I was certain. He shrugged and said he was glad that I got Baxter back and then gave me my cash. I figured it wasn't my problem anymore and just went home. Well, a little under a year later, Baxter went missing again. He'd snuck out of the house at night when the back door was left ajar. It didn't shock me, to say the least. He was born on a farm after all, and the outdoors were his calling. Even if the outdoors had all sorts of predators lurking in the woods, some more terrifying than others. A few days passed and Baxter never came home. I helped my buddy put up missing cat posters, but deep in my heart, I already knew what had happened. My buddy was in denial and he would spend a lot of time in his woods searching for his cat. It wasn't until he himself saw the same hunched-over figure 
of the canine-like creature lurking in between the trees in the distance did he realize I wasn't lying. I just wanted to tell him I told you so, but he was grieving with the loss of a pet on top of all the other crap going on in his life. He sold the house eventually and moved in with me, which was helpful because even though since I'd gotten a job, it was just barely enough money to keep my head above the water. My landlord also amended the rules and began allowing pets, with a fee, of course. It wasn't long before another cat made its way into our apartment. My place wasn't anywhere near the woods, but my friend and I were both extremely careful to make sure our new cat didn't get anywhere outside the apartment. I still wasn't much of an animal person, and I still am not, but with that dog creature's gigantic claws that were practically kitchen knives and teeth I could only presume were equally as heinous, I can only imagine the fate that must have met Baxter. I couldn't allow another creature to experience a gruesome death again. I didn't know whether I was too big a prey for the thing to hunt upon. I would be surprised if I was, given that thing had to be a good nine or ten feet tall, but I found myself feeling grateful that I managed to escape. My luck ended there though. For years, I had nightmares filled with vivid depictions of becoming a victim to this thing. I'd have dreams where my innards were ripped out and my neck was crushed within its jaws. The worst part though, was that my buddy also had nightmares, except I was still the one being killed in them. He said that he could only stand there and watch. I'm not particularly religious or anything, but I do sometimes wonder if something watching over me spared me of that fate, or maybe I just simply slipped through the cracks, and Baxter was the second best thing. I have been reluctant to share my story because of my field of work, and do not want to have people think I'm crazy as this could severely damage my career. But, as I get older, I feel this incident needs to be documented. The incident occurred in the winter of 1980, just a few miles east of Clayton, Alabama, in Barber County. I was traveling with my aunt, grandmother, and four younger cousins to a relative's house. It was dark and probably around 9pm from the best that I can remember. For some reason though, my aunt needed to turn around and proceeded to pull off the roadway by a small clearing. I was in the front seat of the car with my aunt, who was driving, and my grandmother. As we turned off the road, the headlights caught a figure in mid-stride. It then immediately froze and did not move anymore. It was about 30 yards away from the car, very close. I could see the entire side view of this creature, and its body was slightly turned so that it was looking at us. The most terrifying thing in my memory is this thing's huge eyes glaring at us. The best way I can describe the creature's expression is stunned. The face was covered in hair except for around the eyes. The hair was dark and appeared longer and wavy looking on the arms and legs. It was very tall and massive, but yet also lean looking. I would say it was easily over seven feet tall, if not more. When it froze in the headlights, one arm was slightly extended behind the creature, and it held this position. At this point, my grandmother was crying and begging for my aunt to drive away. Two of my younger cousins were huddled on the floorboard in the back seat crying. I was terrified but could not look away. My aunt kept telling my grandmother, there is no way he can get in this car, and she kept the car still and we watched this motionless creature for about two to three minutes. It was almost completely motionless. It was as if the creature thought we could not see him if he did not move. I don't know how it stood so still. The hair on my neck is standing on end as I type this. It scared me terribly. He kept staring at us with those eyes stretched very wide open. I'll never forget that look he gave us. Finally, my aunt decided to flash the lights on and off real quick. The instant that she did this, the creature jumped toward the woods and was gone. He was about 10 yards from the woods, but made it there in less than a second. I can't believe how fast this huge creature could move. 
The event itself traumatized me. I have never been able to go into the woods alone or enjoy camping since this event. I tried to deer hunt but could not enjoy it and quit. I cannot sit alone in a tree stand without thinking of this creature and becoming tense. I can't imagine coming upon this thing alone in the wilderness. I know these creatures exist. There is no doubt in my mind. I saw one up close and personal. We never saw the creature again. My grandmother says that she and my late grandfather saw a strange creature near their home in the early 1950s. This home is located about four miles from my original 1980s sighting. She and my grandfather went out on the front porch late one night and saw a creature standing in the edge of the woods near the house. They could only see its chest and arms in the shadows. She said it was tall and hairy. My grandfather yelled at the creature and it ran back into the woods towards a stream and made a great deal of noise thrashing throughout the trees and brush. She said they did find some strange three-toed footprints the next day, but they never had another encounter with the creature after my incident. In 1979 and 1980, I was living in my grandparents' old home place on our family farm in Alabama. The farm was about 300 acres of woods, covering an area of deep hollows leading down to sloughs off a river. In late summer and fall of 79, we had been having trouble with deer poachers and some cattle rustling on our farm. So I was spending a lot of time out at night and on my off days trying to catch them. Several times at night and a couple of times during the day, I had heard strange screams back in the woods towards the river. The first time I heard them, I thought it might be a peacock or a screech owl, but it really didn't sound like either and it seemed to be much louder and much more prolonged. I really didn't think much of it until one night I was walking back to the house from the back of the farm at about 11 p.m. It was a clear night with a bright half moon shining and I could see quite well. I was skirting along the south edge of the woods about a half mile due north of the house when suddenly I got a creepy feeling that I was being watched and or was in danger. My skin started crawling and the hair on the back of my neck and hands stood up. At the same time, my dog, a large Doberman Pinscher, started acting nervous and whining quietly and started looking back over his shoulder to our left towards the wood line. I eased the safety off my rifle and increased my pace. Right at that instant, something screamed right in the edge of the woods less than 35 yards behind and to the left of us. The pitch and volume of the scream was incredible. I could feel my chest vibrating from the loudness of the scream. My dog and I both broke and I ran to our right into the pasture, about 50 yards, and I spun around and stopped with my rifle up to see if it was chasing us, but it wasn't. I stood there with my rifle up and whatever it was screamed at us five or six more times. Also, I could hear movement in the dry leaves where the sound was coming from. It sounded like a large person pacing back and forth. I could also see the tops of some saplings and the small trees sway and move as it bumped into them or pushed and pulled on them. The screams were longer lasting and a little lower pitched than what I had heard before. I also know for sure that they weren't bobcat screams. I became aware of the sound of our cattle running away towards the southwest. The woods got quiet but I knew it was standing there, still watching me, but I never saw anything. I backed away for about a hundred yards and then broke into a jog back to the house, spinning around and stopping with my rifle up and about every 50 yards or so, just to make sure it wasn't following me. A few nights go by. I was up late, 1.30 a.m. and getting ready for bed. I came out of the bathroom into my bedroom and my dog was standing there, staring towards the front of the house. He was completely stiff, with the hair standing up on the back and the neck and he was growling very low and menacingly. It was the only time I have ever seen him do that and he was deadly serious. I got a glimpse of a shadow move across the corner of my front bedroom window moving towards the west side of the house. The moon was shining right on the west wall of the house. My dog turned towards the west and kept growling even more seriously. Then. I saw a large, sort of human-shaped shadow move across both windows on the west side of the house. The dog kept turning and growling and following the shadow, 
whatever it was, had to have been about 10 feet tall to cast a shadow that far up on the windows. I was petrified with fear. I finally picked up my riot shotgun and chambered a round of buckshot. My dog at this time was staring towards the north window of the spare bedroom and was still stiff, but not growling quite as bad. I got up enough nerve to look out the bathroom window, but saw nothing. My yard was surrounded by a three foot high hog wire fence with two strands of barbed wire on top and locked steel gates. So whatever it was stepped over the fence to get into and out of my yard. The gates made a lot of noise if you try to climb or open them, so it did not come or go through the gates. And the following weeks, while I was walking through the woods near the river, in two different locations, I found several deer that had been killed. At the time, I thought poachers had done it, but they were all complete except for having their abdomens cut torn open and the guts pulled out. None of the meat was gone from any of them, other than what possums or coons had eaten, and most of them had broken legs. Only one was a buck, and it was a yearling spike. One of the deer had been killed right where I found it. There were broken limbs and saplings and hair all around it. There were tufts of deer hair hung in the bark of two larger trees next to the carcass. Some of the tufts were over 10 feet off the ground. Both of the deer's back legs were broken and twisted. Even then, I thought that it looked like something had grabbed that deer by the back legs and beaten it to death against the tree. I didn't tell anybody about any of this. My dad and other folks had told me that people had been hearing and seeing strange things along that part of the river for decades. But I had a neighbor that had told about seeing a Bigfoot on his property just a few years earlier, and everybody laughed at him. In the early fall of 1980, my wife was bringing in the wash one night, about 7 p.m. I had fed the horses some oats about 30 minutes earlier, and I was now in the kitchen, and suddenly I heard a scream outside. I ran out and my wife was running in, scared nearly to death. Something was right outside the gate between the storage shed and the tack room, screaming just like before. The horses went running out there, wide open. The fence and gate there is quite high because there is a corral there also. I could hear it moving around, but only get a glimpse of it occasionally. It was much taller than the six foot fence there, and it appeared to be black with maybe a little silver or gray mixed in. There's a street light in our yard on that side of the house, and when it moved under through a patch of light, I could see the light glint off its fur. It was tall enough that it hit or shoved aside some tree limbs that I had to jump to be able to touch. It screamed several more times, and I could tell that it was becoming more and more agitated. Between screams, I could hear it making a very eerie, strange noise with an intermittent clicking sound that sounded like it was growling as it chewed or moved its mouth. I ran back to the house and locked all my doors. We moved shortly after that, and I spent hardly any time on the farm until we moved back to the area in 1997. My son, daughter, and I, and a couple of two friends were coon hunting on the back of the farm near the river last year, which would have been November 1999. And the dogs were down on the east side of the ridge, and we were waiting up on the top of the ridge for them to tree. We started to hear the same screams as before, 600 yards to the west of us in one of the areas where I had found a dead deer before. The screams lasted maybe 30 seconds to a minute and then came to a stop. We had tried to get the dogs to go in that direction earlier and they wouldn't and we tried again, but they kept circling back around and going to the truck. And these are championship dogs. I didn't get to go back in the woods there until April of this year, which is 2000. I found fresh deer bones in the area where I had found several dead deer 20 years before. Was working at my construction site late into the night, getting some tools out of my truck when the most horrific roar came from the woods surrounding the site. A few of us on the night crew stopped, looked around and then at each other and shrugged. We were spooked, but we had a job to do. We weren't going to let some silly noises stop us. We continued doing our night crew work and things went as normal for the next few hours. We actually forgot about the roar until we heard some banging and clanging out by our work trucks. 
since I was the supervisor on shift, I thought a couple things. One, one of our crew members was banging around, destroying things, or could have needed help. Or two, somebody was trying to steal our shit. I paced on over to where my work truck is, and as I'm about 20 feet away from my truck, out pops this horrible looking face from behind the bed of the truck. I stopped in my tracks. This shape stood up to tower over the bed of the truck. It looked down into the bed and reached to pick up what looked to be a dead animal from the bed of the truck. If I had to guess, maybe a small deer, and then looked right back at me, turned around and walked off into the night. Had I just seen a werewolf in the living flesh? Those teeth and that face. I was stunned for a few moments, not sure what the hell just happened. I felt like I was living in a dream in that very moment. These kinds of things don't exist in reality. So what the hell did I just see? Its teeth really stuck out to me, no pun intended. It bothered me. Nothing should have that many teeth. It was like looking into the mouth of a shark. So many teeth, all razor bladed. I knew those teeth were meant to shred meat to pieces. After a moment, I slowly walked back to my workers where they were laughing at me, joking what all that banging was. I was pale as a ghost, and apparently because they were asking me why I was so white. Did I see a ghost? Did I get scared of working out at nighttime? I just ignored it and just told them to keep working and drop it. Since we were doing the night crew thing that night, we left when the morning crew arrived later that morning as the sun rose. As I made my way back to my truck to leave, there was light, so things were a little more visible. There were blood splatters all along the side of the back of my truck. That's when I finally put the pieces together and realized that whatever was standing behind my truck was banging the small dead deer it had against my truck. That's what the banging was. I don't know if it was doing that to kill the small deer or if it was doing it to get somebody's attention to draw them over to my truck for an ambush. Whatever it was gave me instant chills as I had memories, vivid memories of those damn teeth again and that thing that stood up behind my truck. I didn't want to think about it anymore. I just got in my truck, ignoring it, and got home and sprayed all the blood off with my hose. That particular job site I got called into to cover a supervisor who had been out scared the living hell out of me and scared me so bad I have had second thoughts about returning as a night shift supervisor. Boy, do I have a hell of a tale for you what lurks beneath. I've never written this to somebody before and I'm hoping you'll be receptive to my experience. I remember it vividly, clear as day, every detail, and so I'm going to lay it out for you, the nitty gritty. 10 years ago, I had just turned 21. Well, almost. It would have been August of 2009. To celebrate, me and three friends of mine drove all the way out to Hiawatha National Forest and Northern Michigan. We drove from Washington State. We wanted to make a road trip out of it with my buddy Nathan who was with me. He had family up in northern Michigan. Our plan was to stop and see his family briefly, and then go party. I was also with my other buddy CJ and his girlfriend Ashley. We had packed everything up on a Friday and left for northern Michigan. We spent about three days in total to reach our destination at Nathan's aunt's and uncle's house. Between all the frequent food stops and bathroom breaks, we were pretty antsy from being in a car for so long and just wanted to get out and go celebrate. We had come to party and that's exactly what we were set out to do. Before we left his family's house, we loaded up on some Jack Daniels and beer. I have had an interesting pass with old Jack. Our plan was to head north, deep into the Hiawatha National Forest and find a good spot just to hike miles in and set up camp. Or so that was the plan. We drove up quite a ways. If I remember accurately, we passed Mapleville, which is way up there in Wisconsin. If you head east of Highway 41, you'll reach this lone road called NF-13 with deep woods on both sides of the road. 
this was where we were going to venture off and begin our celebration. Along NF-13, there are several different pullouts. Well, I'm going to call them pullouts for this story, because they're not necessarily roads either. They're more like pathways with only vehicle marks on the ground to indicate that you can drive down there. We suspected there to be campers or whatnot in them since they were just unmarked and we didn't want to invade anyone's privacy. So we just pulled our car off to the right of the road and got all of our stuff out and ready to go. We got all of our backpacks on and the camping equipment and beer and we were going to head out with handfuls of stuff. There's no marked camping spots or campgrounds where we were headed. I was aware that there was a campground within 20 miles of us. I'm not sure whether south or north, but we wanted to just go and explore the woods. Be more secluded. I knew there was a stream west of NF-13, so we headed in that direction. We probably spent two or so hours pushing onward west through the thick woods. We had our backpacks, tents, and cases of beer. It took us hours with all the breaks we had to take to get and find the perfect spot. But once we found it, that was it. We quickly set up our camp and started blasting music through our iPod. We had brought little speakers that were battery powered that we started blaring Little Wayne through. We were cracking beers and drinking Jack and going crazy. At this time, I don't know the exact time, but the sun was starting to set. It was in August, so I don't know, maybe seven? Either way, we had a ton of beer. I shotgunned so much beer that I vomited at one point. Ashley and CJ were having a great time, but sought to retreat to their tent multiple times for 15 minutes because they needed to talk in private. We all knew what they were doing, and they were pretty vocal about that. Well, Ashley was, at least. Anyway... That would just leave me and Nathan to pound more beers. This repeated until about 11 p.m. I remember that because I had left my phone in my backpack all day and wanted to see if I had any service at all and pulled it out. I didn't have service, but it was 11.02. I felt fairly drunk, but was not shit-faced. Nathan was so drunk, and I think CJ and Ashley were either having pillow talk or they had passed out at this point. So much for staying up late on my 21st, I thought. Nathan and I thought we would start to tone it down and just sat by the fire we made and bullshitted for maybe another hour or two before it was time to settle into our tent. Oh, I should expand on that. We brought two tents in total, one for me and Nathan to share and one for CJ and Ashley that they shared. They were across from one another with the fire in between us. Once in our tent, it didn't take us long to settle in our sleeping bags with a hearty, Night bro. And in my half-drunken stupor, I passed out. Next thing I know, I'm being shaken awake by Nathan. Wake up! Wake up! It took me a couple of seconds to come to, but now I'm pissed he's woken me up. So I snapped at him. He grabs me and says he thinks there's a bear outside of our tent. I shut up and I quietly listen intently, just like he is. Interestingly, the first thing I heard or didn't hear was the sound of the forest. It was August and the forest was alive and full of bugs and crickets all night during our drinking binge. Now it had fallen silent. I didn't hear a single sound. That was off. Then I started to hear heavy thuds, like from a heavy animal. Then I really started thinking there was a bear walking around our tent. It sounded big and I could tell it was close. Me and Nathan looked at each other and held our breath. We heard this thing get close to our tent and start sniffing. I really began to freak out, trying my best not to scream. I was terrified of bears and I knew absolutely nothing about the temperament of bears, other than the fact that they can eat you. The sniffing continued and then this animal seemed to totter off away from our tent it started to huff and grunt like bears do. We heard it start to leave our tent and can hear it still making noises. The noises begin to trail off further and further. It started to get quiet and I remember telling Nathan that we can relax. The bear was just strolling through and now it's gone. As soon as I finish that sentence, I hear this crazy animal squeal and roar like I had never heard in my life. 
Nathan and I's attention snapped over to the side of the tent, freaking out. We started hearing a bunch of roaring, growling, and commotion going on. It was hard to tell how far away it was. It was in the middle of the night and it was pitch black outside. It couldn't have been too far away. We knew it was somewhat close by. The roaring ceased after maybe 30 seconds. I could not exactly tell what the fuck we just heard. It sounded like a bear fighting off a dinosaur. It was the most frightening thing to listen to in the middle of the night in the pitch black darkness. Nathan and I are basically shitting bricks at this point, shaking when we hear CJ scream out in the distance. He sounded far away, but it was undeniably his voice. Nathan and I shot each other a panicked look, and I quickly and slowly and as quiet as I could unzipped the tent, just enough that I could see his and CJ's tent. The door flap was open. I turned back to Nathan and told him it was CJ. I slightly stuck my head out of the tent and yelled, but whispered at the same time, Ashley, are you in there? I heard her softly sobbing in the tent. She whispered up telling me she heard CJ scream too, and all of the commotion but was too scared to get out of the tent. She didn't even know he had left the tent until she had awoken to all the commotion. The woods at this time were silent, and we weren't sure what to do. Nathan argued in whispers that we need to go out and look for him to make sure he's okay. And I started arguing back saying, did you hear what we just heard? I'm not going out there with what we heard. That's when we started to hear noises in the brush nearby. Then we started to hear the growling. It was extremely low. I remember the bass to it. It was demonic and not all the same energy like the bear brought earlier. This was different entirely. The bear that we were certain was in our camp before was sniffing around and probably just curious. We could tell it was a bear just alone due to its huffing sounds and breaths and the thuds on the ground. There was just certain sounds bears make. I mean, it was unmistakable. This though was different. The footsteps sounded incredibly heavy, but heavy in a different way. It sounded like it was walking on two legs not four different legs, and it sounded slow, like this animal was trying to be sly. The growling and humming it emitted were so evil. I don't know how to relay the emotion. Nathan and I turned white. We knew we were in grave danger. Something else besides a bear was outside of our tent. I was frozen in fear, but I knew I had to do something. I didn't have any weapons on me or near me. I had a pocket knife in my backpack somewhere, but that wasn't going to help me at all in this situation. Nathan pulls out this police-like flashlight, which I didn't even know he had out of his sleeping bag, and shines it outside the tent flap, looking around with a flashlight at whatever was around the camp. My heart dropped at his bravery in fear of him invoking whatever animal is out there and that where and here. He didn't care. He wanted to try and scare this animal off. He moved the light just right, and at some point, fully illuminated, right by this tree, the ugliest wolf, if you want to call it that, that we have ever seen. It was looking down at the ground and slowly lifted its head up to meet its gaze with Nathan's beam of light. It let out a nasty growl. It was pissed. I started crying. The size of this thing's claws and teeth alone were enough to do it right in that moment. But its size alone and the fact that I was looking at a werewolf standing 30 feet away from our tent really drove it home. Nathan quickly turned the flashlight off and zipped up our tent as fast as he could and dove back into his sleeping bag. I've never seen him so pale in my life. I thought he was going to puke. I was on the verge of having a mental breakdown, knowing that we just saw what we did and it was real. Now I'm stuck in this tent. CJ is gone and poor Ashley is left all alone in the nearby tent, unsure of her safety. We have no weapons and there's a goddamn werewolf walking around our tents. But things quieted down. We didn't hear anything. Not even the thudding of this thing's footfalls walking around now. That made me, made us even more nervous. What if it was sneaking around now? What if it was employing stealth to try and get us? We had to stay awake. We could not fall asleep in case this thing tried to get us. 
This was the worst passing of time I have ever experienced in my life. We were probably in that tent for hours upon hours, just lying awake, constantly on high alert and aware of our surroundings, but couldn't move. We finally started to see daylight at some point, but didn't want to risk getting out of the tent until we had more visible light. We were so exhausted from the sheer adrenaline rush and the intensive amount of fear. Nobody, none of us had really slept at all. If at any point during this experience I still had alcohol in my system, it had scared me stone cold sober. I guess I should have checked my phone for the time, but I didn't. It was summer, so it gets bright early, like 5am, so maybe it was between then and 6. Nathan finally signaled for us to get out of the tent and just leave our shit. We were going to grab our essentials, but fuck the tents and the beer. We didn't want anything to do with being out this far in close contact with that freak of nature, freak of a monster out here. Once it was light enough, we got out of the tent. We could see enough that our camp had been thoroughly rummaged through. Whether it had been done by the bear or whatever it was we saw, we weren't quite sure. We ran over to Ashley and CJ's tent, and Ashley had been curled up in the fetal position asleep. We woke her up and told her we needed to go find CJ and get out now. She had fallen asleep from pure exhaustion. I don't blame her. We started to head back towards the way we came. Luckily, I know we weren't far from the vehicle, so we headed back in that direction. Now, this is where shit got really real for us. We're running back with just our backpacks towards where we believe we parked on NF-13. We're yelling for CJ, but nothing of course. There was a bloody trail and we couldn't make out what it was, but if I had to guess, it looked like an animal had been killed and then dragged. It was dragged in the direction where we were heading. So we walked back in the early morning. These drag marks went alongside of us. Up on this little hill as we got to the top, there it was, well, what was left of it at least. A large, or when it was alive, black bear. Its body was bloody, mangled, and crushed to a pulp with its guts ripped out and strewn across the ground. It looked like this thing had been crushed by a boulder. Nathan and I were speechless when we came across it, and Ashley gasped. She started crying, saying she just wanted to go home. I knew in that moment if we didn't get back to the car now and escape, we were going to be killed. I don't know what the hell is out there in the woods that can take down an adult sized black bear, but I didn't want to mess with it. I was filled with fear and adrenaline again, and at one point back to the car, the thought that CJ might have been killed and eaten haunted me. We never found him. We did eventually make it back to the car by the miracle of God himself. It was still early in the morning and no sign of CJ still. Now, we're standing by the car, arguing whether to leave and go find help or to go back in the woods and look for CJ. Ashley is just crying hysterically while me and Nathan are continuously arguing about what to do when we see this lone car in the distance head our way. Then we see the lights and immediately recognize that is a cop car. We turn and signal the car down and the car stops in the road. The cop gets out and asks us if we were okay and what was going on. We explain to the officer our story of what happened and he tells us that CJ is in the hospital. He made a beeline for the road last night after being attacked by some unknown animal, suffered deep wounds in his back and left arm. Something attacked him. Most likely a bear, the cop said, due to the claw size and the amount of sheer tissue damage and blood loss, but he almost bled out and was transported to the hospital. A different officer just happened to be driving by and found him waving on the road, bleeding like a stuck pig. This officer was sent here to come look for us. I guess CJ had mentioned he had three other friends, maybe a mile or two in the woods, that we needed help. The officer told us he would like to take our names and take our story down. He allowed us to drive to the hospital and meet up with CJ, and of course, he followed. We got to the hospital and CJ was sleeping, all bandaged up. The same officer really began asking questions, even though we told him exactly what happened. Even though CJ was all bloody, he began acting weird. 
I don't think he believed us. Turns out the PD actually thought we conspired to attack and kill CJ, and that the whole werewolf bear phenomena thing we experienced was just a clever cover-up to mask our failed attempt at murder. Things got a little crazy and we were brought in for questioning, each of us of course, but CJ's story once again had come to save us. He was able to tell that his story lined up with all of our other stories that we experienced. Detectives got to him before we did, so they were able to get his story first and foremost. He told them he had gotten up in the middle of the night to take a piss when he thought he heard a bear approaching. Then, he says he heard all of this crazy commotion, like two big animals fighting, and he fled off into the night with only his phone light. Something ran after him. Something that looked like a wolf walking on two legs and tried to grab him, but it didn't. It slashed his back and left arm pretty bad. He says the run from that to the road was a blur and didn't even realize he was bleeding as much as he had. He literally had fat oozing out of his wounds, they were so deep. Absolute crazy shit that no one will ever tell you. So there it is, that's my story. I remember it vividly like I said and I'll carry it around with me forever and I will never forget it. I still keep in contact with Nathan on Facebook and don't see much of CJ anymore. He took a coding job down in Western Virginia and obviously made a full recovery. I'll have to see if I can get him to send me a pic of his scars so I can show you. They're gnarly. Oh, and him and Ashley broke up a long time ago, so I haven't kept in contact with her in ages. But there you go. Believe it or not, I swear by the Bible and all that is holy that this is what happened to us, including the accusations that we somehow tried to murder CJ and that whole mess. I'm glad it's in my past where it thoroughly belongs. It was about July 5th, 2015. It was late, about 3.30 a.m. I had fallen asleep on my cousin's sofa, about 10 p.m. after a long day at our family reunion. All of a sudden, the dog started going crazy. It woke me up, so I kind of laid there, thinking to myself I wish they would shut up. Then, all of a sudden, I heard one of the dogs yell out like it was hurt. Then, I heard the sound of something coming up on the front porch, so I sat up to look out the front window. It just so happens that we left the porch light on, and what I saw was unforgettable and unbelievable. It was squatting down right in front of me. I guess it was too big to stand straight up on the porch. I don't know why it was there, but we had left the empty beer and soda cans and leftover food scraps and a couple of trash bags to be thrown out the next day. But to make a long story short, I was no more than 8 to 10 feet away from it. I looked at it for what seemed like an hour, but I never actually saw its face because its back was to me the whole time and I never leave my 45 caliber. But for some reason, I did not have it with me this time. If I had, you would have had a corpse to show the world, but this thing has become aggressive in this area of Alabama where my family lives. July 8th, it kills my cousin's bulldog. In May, it chases another family member. In June, it looks into a family member's window in broad open daytime. So I'm trying to get some of the guys together and try and kill it because no one will do anything to research and capture this thing. We know where it lives and how it travels. All we want is for somebody to capture it and remove it. I live in Texas, but my family resides in Alabama and they are living in fear of this thing. So it has to go one way or another. My wife and I used to live in Southern Ohio for quite some time. My wife worked as a nurse and would be pulling all sorts of random shifts. Sometimes her schedule would call her to work from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., while other times she would work from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. It was so sporadic and it really wore her down the few years she worked at that hospital. For those in question, they were extremely short staffed during this time period and she was willing to give her soul to her job, having just got out of med school and having need to build her career. I would try and call her on her breaks through the hospital line and check up on her. This was back in the early 90s, so we didn't have cell phones or anything like that. Everything was landlines. One night, 
she was returning home in the early morning hours. I can't give you an exact time, because I believe my wife doesn't exactly remember. She knows it was after midnight, but before sunrise. She was driving back home when having to make a sharp bend in the road before pulling into another road that leads down to our house. As she made the sharp bend in the road, her headlight shone her something straight from the pits of hell. Crouching about 50 feet away from the road was this large dark brown shape that had a wolf-like appearance, but had a human-like physique. She said when her headlights hit this thing, it gave no eye shine. Instead, she told me that this thing had coal black eyes, and it was like they absorbed the light of the headlights of the car. Everything else lit up, even the fur glistened in the shine of the light, but the eyes were a solid black. She was in hysterics and stayed that way until she pulled up into the house and ran in the house in a fray. It really terrified her seeing what she did that night. I knew for years afterward she had nightmares about that wolf face with the black eyes haunting her in her sleep. Terrified it would find her and come after her. We moved about four years later but she never ended up seeing that same creature that night. I really have no choice but to believe her, I mean, my wife is a very on point individual. She wouldn't just make up something like that. It still haunts me how she came in the house, trembling with fear and weeping. For a while, she wanted to see a psychiatrist about hallucinating, but she said it was real and she just didn't make it up. She had been working all sorts of shifts for a long time and possibly chalked it up to exhaustion, but even then, nothing. No matter what time of night or day she came home, she never saw it again. This was the first and last time she saw what she did. I was driving a VW bus, so I had a good view of my surroundings. As I rounded the first corner of the exit, I noticed what I thought was a big white dog, like an Afghan running on all fours towards the road, up on an embankment. We both reached the same point at the same time, and I thought I would hit the dog. It seemed it didn't notice my car until it reached the side of the road, when it was only feet away. I don't remember slowing much, but I wasn't going very fast to start with, as the curve was pretty tight. As the creature reached the road and I saw it, it stood up on its back legs. It was covered with long white hair, maybe eight inches long. It wasn't thick, but more stringy and dirty looking, and it had a round head, not a dog. I passed the creature and didn't catch it in my mirrors as it was dark. It scared me. I didn't get much detail of its face, but I did notice a fairly large mouth or lips which were very prominent. The head was not huge and the body was fairly slender. It was probably as tall as the VW when it stood up, well over six feet. At approximately 1.30 in the morning, on a night in February 2000, the witness and a friend were planning to visit a girl who lived close to the sighting location. They were riding together on a motorcycle and knew they would not be able to ride up to the girl's house without altering her mother of their presence. They decided to hide the bike on the side of a dirt road and walk to the house from there. Very shortly thereafter, they began to hear what the witness described as a very heavy walking, stomping noise. The witness described these sounds as similar to one, an extremely large person walking, or two, like a horse galloping, but only on two legs, coming from a swampy area which was only northeast of their location. They squatted in the bushes and listened for a couple of moments, at which time they determined the noise was getting closer to them and increasing in pace. At this time, they decided to make a break for the motorcycle and vacate the area. The friend of the witness was in the lead and caused a branch to swing back, hitting the witness in the head, knocking him down and damn near knocking him out. He got back up and began running after his friend, all the while hearing the sounds of stomping and crashing of underbrush, getting closer and closer to them. When he reached the spot where the motorcycle had been stashed, his friend was already pushing it out towards the road. He commented that at this time, he could also hear heavy breathing which seemed to coincide with each footfall. Once they had the bike on the road, they both jumped on and his friend managed to kick start it and take off. 
The witness stated that he looked back just in time to see a very large creature leap from the edge of the woods out onto the road. I later measured this distance and it was around 12 feet to 15 foot. He said it hit the road on all fours and then stood, fully erect. He did comment that when the creature landed on the road, it let out an audible grunt he could hear even above the noise of the motorcycle. He said the moon was full, or near full, and it was already in the western sky, causing the creature to stand in its own shadow. Since the creature was silhouetted, he was unable to make out any such details like facial features. However, he did emphasize to me that what he saw was not a bear, as he's seen bears before and they were much more narrow than what he saw. He also emphasized this by hunching his arms forward and dropping his shoulders to indicate how a bear would stand, and then standing fully erect with his arms out from his sides in the stance that he said he observed the creature to be in. He said this creature was very wide and had fluffy-like hair, which covered it entirely. He was unable to see any fingers on the hands, although he did state from what he could tell, the hands appeared to be clenched and that the arms were no longer than a human's. He also said that from what he could see, the creature appeared to be a dark brown or black color. When asked about the height of the animal, he said it was at least six to seven feet tall. After thinking for a moment, he stated that his father is 6'4", and that this thing was bigger than his dad, making it closer to seven feet in height total. At the end of January 2013, I was traveling north on Alabama Highway 51 in northern Coffee County in a rural area approximately one mile south of the Dale County line just before dark. I estimate the time to be around 5 p.m. As I approached a left curve, I noticed a large dark mass in the roadway. At this point, I was within 100 yards of it. Suddenly, it moved to my right and in about three steps, it was on the shoulder of the road facing me. It was a bipedal creature, approximately 9 feet tall with a shoulder span approaching 4 feet with the most intense yellow-green eyes that I've ever seen, spaced around 6 to 8 inches apart. In my headlights, I could see it was covered in gray-brown hair. The face was ape-like with dark brown, black, leathery skin. This creature lifted its left arm, possibly to shield its eyes or perhaps anticipating being hit as I was about 30 feet from it. Then, I was past it. It took several seconds for the significance of what had occurred to sink in. It was a few days after Hurricane Frederick. I was 11 years old at the time. We lived in a trailer on Hurricane Road, and my grandparents owned the Hurricane Landing and Fish Camp, what is now Perkins Landing. We were left without power after the hurricane, so all of our food was on ice. It was about 11 p.m., and my dad asked me to walk to my grandparents' store and get some ice. So I grabbed a flashlight and took off walking. It was less than a quarter of a mile from our house to the store, and I was already very used to walking the route on a daily basis. So I'm walking down the left side of the road, and I could hear the dogs barking and really cutting up. They belonged to an older man who lived in a little white house down the road on the right. He kept them in a pen behind his house, so when I get in the front of the house, I shine my light across the street, at and around the house. Suddenly, I see something very large run from behind the house on two legs. I followed it with my light as it ran towards the woods, and then it stopped and turned and looked at me. Its eyes glowed red in the dark and all of a sudden, it runs straight at me. It was so fast. I mean, it traveled probably about 30 or 40 yards in just a flash, and then it stopped right at the edge of the road. I was scared frozen. I couldn't scream or run, and we just stood there for what seemed like an eternity, but in all actuality was probably just a second or two. Then suddenly, it let out a high-pitched growling sound, and then I screamed, and it turned and ran, and I ran all the way home. When I got home, I was so upset that I could hardly breathe or talk. My parents finally calmed me down, and I told them what happened, but they didn't believe me. The next day, my dad and my uncle went down there to look for tracks, but they didn't find any. My uncle told me I probably saw a bear, but 
Even I know, a bear can't run on two legs. The creature I saw was extremely large. I would have to say now that it was at least seven feet tall, very broad shoulders, covered from head to toe in dark brown to black hair. His mouth and large, square teeth kind of stuck out from the rest of the face, and the eyes were sunk in. As a veteran, I can tell you that I've never been so scared in my life. On November 9th, 2008, a suspicious knocking was heard about 3 a.m. as my husband was camping with Boy Scouts on the side of a ridge southeast of Henderson Peak, about 200 yards from State Road 281. This is just south of the Chiaha State Park line. It was about 14 degrees with intermittent howling wind. There were three sets of two knocks each, about 100 yards north of the campsite described as a piece of firewood hitting another. It was very loud and the knocks, though themselves rhythmic, were spaced so that the wind died down before they occurred again. These were not little limbs hitting each other and he was not able to determine if there was any response because of the wind. There were no campers north of them and the only other campers on the mountain that were encountered was another Boy Scout troop camping about four miles away, directly on Lake Chinobi. My husband is an avid Bigfooter who awoke and immediately felt that this was consistent with other knocking activity. Due to the inclement conditions and not wanting to scare the younger kids in the camp, he did not have the chance to follow up. Although he didn't mention the sounds the next morning, another adult did, and with careful roundabout questioning, all other factors for the sounds were excluded, like trees falling, wind, limbs hitting each other due to the wind, etc. I am typing this since he was not sure of the cause of the sound and was reluctant to report something that may not have been genuine. There are other reports of activity in the Talladega areas and we know of one other not reported in Perry County. This particular sighting happened in July of 2007 and was about a one hour drive, shorter as the crow flies, from this incident. My husband also observed suspicious activity as a youth 12 to 14 while hiking with his uncle somewhere in the vicinity of the Vincent County in the form of a huge noise about 40 yards from them as they stood in a creek and upon climbing out observed twisted branches about two inches thick and uprooted bushes which was taken as the huge sound they heard. He was not interested nor had knowledge of Bigfoot at the time. It affected them so much though immediately and they left the area. I was deer hunting in Freedom Hills management area around Coon Dog Cemetery. I entered the woods before daylight and walked down the access road next to a pine forest. I came to the back of some pines where they had turned into heavy hardwoods. I sat down at the bottom of a tree and waited for daylight. During my way up, behind me on top of the ridge, I hear a series of grunting and heavy movement through the woods, walking down the ridge behind and down the ridge it went. Once daylight came, I walked up to where I first heard the grunting and movement. As I got to the area, I found bedding and hair. The hair I found I kept as a sample, and it wasn't wild hog or bear, nor mountain lion. This whole incident scared me and made me very uneasy. Later that night we heard wood knocks and had a tree pushed down. I enjoy hunting throughout the Michaux State Forest, located in Pennsylvania. There's many of us around here that enjoy a good bow hunt, and I am no exception. To give you a better layout of the state forest, this area is a higher elevated forest, full of white pine and oak trees all throughout with thicker flowers and brush. This was in 2003, and I've had several friends who've been hunting in and around this area for years. I've gotten warnings that because of the lush population of deer, there's a high amount of Bigfoot activity in certain areas. I was a Bigfoot believer before this happened to me, but I had no idea these wolf creatures existed. I didn't even think it was a possibility. I've gone hunting in this forest a few years prior to this event and never had anything strange occur, so I was confident and ready to get myself a nice trophy buck this year. I got up in the wee early hours before sunrise and made it out there with my bow. 
I remember the air being crisp and cool. The onset of fall was really setting in this particular year. I remember walking quite a ways and making it to one of my stands that I had set up in the area. This particular one I had perched quite high up in the tree, more so than normal. I climbed up and climbed in, pulled out my coffee flask and sat and waited. I don't know at what point that I noticed the silence, but I became aware after some time the woods had died. Nothing. You could hear a pen drop from a mile away. It felt eerie. I've been doing this for a while and I've never had my skin crawl like it did in that moment. From what I would estimate to be about 300 plus yards away in the woods was a bunch of whimpering and howling. This was loud. It sounded distorted, not like you would expect if you heard a coyote or a wolf, both of which I've heard and it didn't quite match these sounds. I was curious and so I kept trying to look around for any movement or anything that I could possibly see. Still, nothing. The whimpering and howling had stopped and I began to hear movement in the brush from a little ways away, coming in my direction. Light was just starting to break and I could start to make out minimal details around me. Things were still dead silent other than this movement that began sounding closer and closer. It sounded heavy and I wasn't sure if it was a deer coming my way or what, but I could make out that there were multiple of whatever animal was approaching my direction. I heard branches breaking to my left and out stepped these three beings. Beings is what I'll call them because it wasn't an animal and it for certain wasn't a human. These three beings walked in unison together on two feet, very tall, if I had to guess, well over six feet. Their fur was charcoal black and looked to be like they absorbed all the light in the area. Their eyes, all three of them had this horrible yellow glow to them as they slowly hunched over and walked slowly through the forest below, taking their time with each stride. I tried to stay quiet and not make a sound as I went into full-on panic mode. These monsters... Whatever they were gave off an incredibly evil vibe. If they wanted to climb up into my stand and devour me alive, they could have easily. I held my breath, trying not to make a sound. Every step these things took, you could feel it in the ground below. I could tell these creatures weighed a great deal of weight. It didn't surprise me with how much mass they carried around and how tall they were. One of them stopped only feet away from my stand. This thing, this thing started lifting up its head and sniffing the air. It sounded loud, like a big bear sniffing right outside somebody's tent. I pissed all over myself. I was so scared. I'm watching all of this transpire before my eyes. I'm very fortunate that my deer stand was up quite a ways in this tree, because had I been lower, it could have just reached up and pulled me out. This thing sniffed the air for a moment and did some sort of weird thing with its mouth. I can't even begin to describe the noise. It was like a clicking noise mixed with a guttural sigh. I don't know how to portray it accurately. It was communicating with the other two. The other two both stopped and looked up in my direction. I felt like I was going to have a heart attack in that moment. I don't think these things saw me, but they looked right up in my stand. One of those things must have signaled for the other two that there was a person up in that stand. I held onto my combat knife like it was my life, and I usually keep it strapped to my thigh, just praying my death would be swift and painless. But they just stood there, all three of them making these clicking, chattering, guttural noises for a moment, and then continued on westward. Once they were out of sight, I began crying. I was petrified. I had a hard time even convincing myself to move my body and I needed to leave before those things got back. If I was caught on foot, I was for sure a dead man. I wasn't going to have that. I managed to work my body enough to climb down my stand and I ran as fast as I could back to where I came and left. I should probably give a little more clarity on what I saw and how exactly long that it lasted. Because of the early morning hours with the sun just starting to break through, lighting conditions were poor at best, 
So a lot of what I saw were massive shapes and silhouettes and those damn glowing yellow eyes. The shape was a massive body with a dog-like head and pointed ears on top. Reminded me of a wolf or a German shepherd face. I could make out a snout, but more specific details were hard to accurately point out. I watched the entire thing out of my people in the stand. As this thing stood below my stand, it did stick its snout up in the air to smell, and I think it smelt me, and then tried to communicate to the others that I was there. Their chattering sounded as if they were arguing amongst themselves, but again, it was very brief. They kept the same pace and stride all the way to where they were no longer visible. The entire occurrence probably only lasted three to five minutes at most, but in the moment, it felt endless. It felt as if time itself had come to an utter stop. I didn't think I was going to make it out alive. That experience alone really ruined the outdoors and hunting for me for quite a while. I had a hard time returning to what I was passionate about, and it took a whole six years till I could muster the courage to approach the woods again to hunt. The first few times back, I didn't go alone either. I wasn't risking something like that happening again. I never did go back to the National Forest and instead hunted with friends on other land or their own properties. I told some of my hunting buddies about what I went through. These same buddies who have had hairy run-ins with Bigfoot himself and they were in disbelief at a pack of whatever I ran into was out there in the woods. I was asked if I think what I encountered was a family of Bigfoots but it didn't behave the way you hear Bigfoots behaving. I don't think Bigfoots have snouts either and don't have ears on the tops of their heads. The way these animals hunched over as if their front arms were longer than their back legs. I've never seen a squatch in my day, but my buddies who have had plenty of run-ins with them have told me a lot about them. I got a feeling that this was a family or group of whatever these were. I'm just glad I was able to survive and tell you my story. When my aunt was about 11 or 12 years old, she was helping her older cousin Jerry in the field at her aunt's house in an area they called Screamer in Henry County, Alabama. It was a hot day and after some time, Jerry grew very thirsty and asked my aunt to walk up the road to the house and get him a glass of water. My aunt then walked through the field back toward the dirt road leading to her aunt's house. Upon reaching the dirt road, she saw two creatures standing on the other side of the road. She stopped and began slowly backing up and then stopped again. She stood there looking at them and they looking at her for about a minute or so, long enough for her to get a good look at them. They were only around 10 feet away from her at that point. She on one side of the dirt road and they on the other. She described them as standing next to each other. One was, in her estimation, around five feet tall, and the other was slightly shorter, around four feet tall. She said that she got the impression they were young. She said that they were really hairy and completely covered in dark brownish black hair, that they looked sort of like gorillas but with human looking faces with hair on them, human looking hands and human looking feet. She said their noses were free of hair and that the color of their noses was dark, brown, or black, as were their feet and hands. They stood very still, other than blinking, just looking at her. Except for being covered in thick hair, their faces looked human with regular human-looking noses. After a minute or so, she took off running as fast as she could back up to the house to get water Jerry had requested. She did not look back as she ran. She got the water and proceeded to walk back toward the field. The creatures were not there anymore. She never told anybody about this incident until just a couple of months ago because she was always afraid people would make fun of her. This would have been in summer of 1953, with the nearest road being Highway 95. About seven years ago, my wife and I were at a lake in the middle of the Talladega National Forest in Alabama. The lake was Sweetwater Lake. We were fishing in a small boat at the end of a slough early in the morning. We were the only ones at the lake. I think it was on a Wednesday and we were all alone. We heard something scream. 
It started out as a howl and turned into a long, high-pitched scream, and it was so loud that it echoed through the mountains. It made the hair stand up on the back of our necks. But that is not all. About a year before that, my stepfather and I were hiking around the same lake. We liked to fish a spillway on the back side of the lake. About half a mile into the hike, we crossed a fire break about 20 feet wide. Now keep in mind that we are pretty good, way back in the woods. We have crossed rocks, thorns, and briars and all kind of rough ground. And right there across the dried mud in the fire break is a set of footprints dried into the mud. They were not huge, they were about the size of a full grown man, but they didn't look human. I just couldn't understand why a man would be this far back in the woods without shoes on. And over the years, there is one thing I have thought about a Bigfoot would have to grow up, so maybe it was a juvenile. Well, me and my cousin were deep in the woods, deer hunting, close to our little campsite, when we heard some very loud popping sounds, maybe 35 yards away. We froze, tried to figure out the sound, but couldn't. We started walking, it was getting late, almost dark, when we started to smell something. It smelled awful, deader than dead. My cousin hears something walking heavy. We turn around to look down the logging road and sees this thing step out of the tree line. It was a good 40 to 45 yards away and had dark brown hair, walked on two legs and was nearly nine to 10 feet tall. The thing just stood there. Out of being so scared, we couldn't move either. I couldn't have shot it if I wanted to, but we stared at each other for about three or four minutes. When it took a step into the woods, we ran. First time ever seeing anything like that. I told some people, but they laughed and asked me how much I had been drinking. But I don't drink, so I saw the sight and decided to get this off my chest. I've been holding on to this for years, and I haven't been deer hunting that far into the woods since then. This was around Highway 72, off of Baker Lane. I just got back from a region known as Matawaska Valley in Renfrew County, about three hours north of me. It is located on the southern edge of Algonquin Park. Several reports have come out of that park, including an encounter I had back in 2008. I had a different experience with three of my other friends in that same park, which involved rock throwing, odor, and even feces found. My family and I rented a cottage this week on a small private lake called Spectacle Lake. The cottage is surrounded by forest and the region has a good population of moose, deer, wolf, beaver, and even bear. On Monday, July 27th, when we arrived at 1500 hours, we got unpacked and got settled in for the afternoon. At 1800 hours, we had a nice dinner and then sat around a big bonfire at approximately 20 hours. At about 22, while sitting and talking around the fire, I heard something across the lake in the distance. I told everybody to be quiet because I could hear something above the sound of our fire. I then heard these series of howls come from across the lake. The distance across the lake is about 500 meters. The area has thick forest with cliffs in the background. The howls seem to come well beyond the distance across the lake, and even beyond the cliffs behind the tree line. I would estimate the cliffs to be approximately 150 meters high. There are no cottages directly across the lake. There are three small cottages at a distance to the north of us. However, no one was at those cottages during the week. Having heard these kind of sounds before, I figured it was a Sasquatch, since I'm a stranger to that. But nobody else in my group has experienced this before. And naturally, they were all taken back and quite excited. Everybody agreed the house did not sound like wolves, coyotes, loons, deer, moose, or any other kind of animal that we are familiar with. These howls went on intermittently for about a half an hour each and they were about three to four howls each time. About midnight, the fire was dying down 
and we all headed into the cottage for the night. But just before going in, we heard a large branch break close by. I would estimate about 20 feet from the cottage and the tree line, and it was a clear distinct crack of a tree limb. I would estimate the tree limb to be about one inch or more. Again, I knew what this was, having experienced this many times, and so I tried to peer into the tree line to see if I could see anything. I heard nothing else and saw nothing. I didn't want to shine a flashlight because I knew this might end the activity for the night, so I just went inside the cottage. We all went to bed shortly afterwards. At 3.30 in the morning, I looked at the time immediately. Something hit or threw something at the cottage very, very hard. It shook the entire cottage and woke all of us up. Keep in mind that this is a fairly large cottage that is two stories tall with a basement walkout and sleeps all eight of us very well. I knew what was happening and got up to look around. I wanted to rule out any of the kids or dogs possibly walking around and maybe knocked something off of a shelf in the dark. So I walked all around the house from top to bottom. Everybody, including the dogs, were in their beds. The dogs never moved from their spots, even though I know they heard and felt the bang. I looked outside and saw nothing in the pitch black darkness, so I just went back to bed. I lay there awake and listened for any other activity. Then, about a half hour later, I could hear something mumbling or grumbling outside the open window. That's the best way I know how to describe it. It was close to my window, but I still could not see anything when I looked out. I did not want to shine a light, hoping for more activity. At 4.15 in the morning, something gave a long, hard, scrape sound along the outside of the cottage. Then, nothing. In the morning at 6.30 a.m., I woke up and checked the outside perimeter of the cottage and the surrounding area. The ground is hard all around the cottage, so I found no imprints. I went inside the tree line, but still could not find no definitive prints. I could see no handprints or signs of damage on the outside walls. I could not find the tree break. I could not see any rocks or sticks lying close to the cottage that could have been thrown. I also found no physical signs of the scrape either. The next night, Tuesday, July 28th, while sitting by our bonfire again, we heard the same screams and howl from across the lake. This would occur off and on until about five in the morning. There was no more activity of any kind on Wednesday or Thursday, but I heard these screams and howls again on Friday, July 31st, during the night. And there were eight witnesses of us in total, either sitting by the campfire and in the cottage. The chances of somebody being out here and trying to play a trick on us is pretty minimal. The area itself is heavily forested on all sides for hundreds and hundreds of miles. This is all Canadian shield-type landscape around the water's edge. It is a very hilly region in the Madawaska Valley with tall, visible rock cliffs and even some swamps. Wildlife is abundant, such as bear, wolves, coyotes, deer, moose, beaver, and other small game, and plenty of fish. First backpacking campsite on the Western Uplands Backpacking Trail, Rain Lake, Algonquin Provincial Park, Ontario, Canada. I was lying in my tent, about to fall asleep, when the forest around me went dead quiet. It was an uneasy feeling. Then, I felt an enormous thud on the ground. The thud was totally silent and did not disturb my sleeping son. I thought that the thud was my heart giving out as it was followed by arrhythmia, and I was praying that this was not the time or the place for me to have a heart attack. I then thought I smelt a skunk smell, but when I breathed in deeper, a second breath, I smelt nothing. The forest remained calm, and I listened intently, thinking we were visited by a bear. The next morning, my son and I did some testing 
as it is possible to feel vibrations from walking on the thin soil overlaying the shield rock, which sounds like hollow ground when walking upon it. We determined that whatever it was had to have been within four feet of the tent. We could not reproduce the amplitude of the thud. We did, however, discover where the animal came down from the trail into the campsite and determined that neither of us had walked that way that night. We also believed that a 400 pound bear could not have produced a thud unless it jumped. I thought that it felt more like a thousand pound moose, but could not explain why a moose would come that close to a designated campsite. I also thought I heard a loon hooting later that night, but the hoot did not just sound right as it was more of a whoop than a hoot and much, much louder. There was a tree about eight inches in diameter that had been snapped off at about two feet above the ground and was there when we arrived in camp. The splinters were fresh on the ground and not covered by other forest debris, such as pine needles and nearby ground conditions. The tree had been snapped off. I noticed this as I cut the splinted end off the stump for firewood in the morning. It had not been chopped down or cut down. It was just a stump. I did not think anything of it at the time. A dead tree blown down in the woods. But in retrospect, it was fresh. No debris on the stump. Which begs the question, where was the fallen tree? Surely somebody could have burned it up all that day. There was not enough fresh ash in the fire pit when we arrived. And also, who cuts up a fallen tree and hauls the whole thing off for firewood? I'm not even so sure that the tree was in that condition when I first surveyed the site, after having went forward to survey the second site and return the first. I didn't notice until after my son and I were both off site for some time, hanging in the bear bags. Finally, earlier that night while preparing for bed, I asked my son several times, what, thinking he was talking to me, but not understanding him, but he said that he said nothing. Listen, I've been in bear country before and had to chase one off before, but there when my son was seven, not 12, which is now, and took my daughter, who's 16 months old, last week. But I can honestly say that this was the most scared that I have ever been. If it was a Sasquatch or whatever they are called, I think I know why they are unhappy with our presence. I tested a bear banger flare at the bridge just to make sure there was one in working order. The wind caught the flare and blew it into a tree. Stupid me. It was embarrassing, having to tell my son to wait on the trail while I investigated to make sure my idiot moment didn't catch the forest on fire. How careless of me. Anybody having observed this stunt would have judged me for a rookie and wouldn't want me camping near them. And well, I am when it comes to backpacking. I have done wilderness canoe camping in areas like this dozens of times through. The place was littered with moose and bear sign, with many bear footprints that seemed large and elongated, more so than what I am used to seeing. Everything was not adding up, and decided to hike out, giving up on the last seven days of our adventure. While walking out, I had the feeling of being watched, and even noticed something large in the bushes about 40 meters away. Upon investigating and finding nothing, I just assumed it was an overactive imagination. But the more I think, the more things begin to add up in my mind. <laughs>